Welcome. Welcome so, to everyone yeah, so. who is a user in a ProQuest. This should be a, a good session. Great. So yes, I'm going to uh, tur turn over this and introduce my new colleagues, April and David, and uh, they're going to be presenting some information and slides, and then we're going to open it up to some uh, feedback from the uh, attendees. So I'll turn it over first to April. I'd like to introduce April Elsie. She's new to ProQuest, but has uh, done some tremendous things already that you'll be hearing about. So April, I'll turn it over to you. I don't think we're hearing you, April. Are you, have you been able to unmute? Austin, I'm having a hard time finding um, April's uh, participation. So I'm not sure, she's not coming up as an attendee um, or a participant currently. So I'm wondering, April, can you hear me? Well, if not, why don't we move over to David and perhaps David could take us through this section and then April can take over when, when she's able to get a connection. Sure, absolutely. Okay, um, thank you. I was just IMing her and trying to find out where she is. I know she was active not too long ago. Um, hello, everyone. David Jenkins, actually uh, new to, to ProQuest, joined at the end uh, uh, beginning of this year. Um, and April, that, who hopefully will join us, was, was new in the end of the year. Um, welcome to the ProQuest uh, Dissertations and Theses section. Austin, if you want to go ahead and advance the slide, we'll just kind of walk through um, what we had in here. Um, so, you know, first of all, uh, I was not a part of previous, um, previous events, but uh, just want to give some updates because we have grown our team uh, significantly, added some other folks um, you're, you're probably familiar with uh, with Oren and Angela who I saw on the call and uh, Austin has been around for quite some time um, but uh, April joined back in I believe it was October or November of last year as a lead product manager over dissertations and theses uh, we had a Jess Byrne as the senior product marketing manager um, Austin help me out I, I'm trying to remember when it was that, that it, if Annie's a recent join or not I mean I should know that but I don't um, she, yeah, she's been at ProQuest a couple of years and has focused on uh, North American dissertations just recently, just this year. Right. That was, that was the transition that it was, wasn't sticking in my head. Thank you for that so much. And then myself, uh, David Jenkins, is a product owner joining the, the, the dissertations and theses team underneath uh, Angela and April. Um, been, been here for, uh, oh gosh, six months now. So very interesting situation where I joined, was in the office for two whole weeks and then uh, became uh, virtual, virtual immediately. So kind of a, an interesting onboarding situation for me, but it's gone well. Uh, so um, going through April slides here, but I've been a part of them. So, you know, first thing that we wanted to go over is kind of what is our, what's, what's on our roadmap? What kind of themes are we talking about um, in the upcoming 2021 20, to 2023 timeframe, which I'll go into a little bit more detail on um, here in a couple of minutes when we get through the, 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 the what we've done slides. Um, number one, we're, we're going to be looking at making some, some uh, updates based on uh, customer input um, and, and prioritizing based on that, uh, making changes to our administrator workflow to, to better serve um, the needs of the administrators that are using um, ETD administrator to, to take care of the ETDs that uh, they're in your responsibilities. Uh, the second uh, section is we're, we're uh, this has come from both our internal uh, customer support side and certainly is direct inputs um, in terms of um, help help ticket suggestions and, and, and other mechanisms, um, but uh, uh, making changes to our student self-service account management. So there's things where people have asked to change uh, uh, email addresses or uh, physical mailing addresses down the road. And, and those are things that have required tickets in the past. And so we're trying to, to see what we can do to, to do things like that, to put it in the, back in the hands of the students so they can take care of that and not have to open support tickets. Um, and then the other thing that's a continuation, and we'll look at it here in a second, of 20 uh, activities in 2020 is our, our web application modernization. Um, you'll see when we get into the next slides, we've spent uh, quite a bit of time here in 2020 uh, doing upgrades for the ETD administrator um, application. Hopefully it's largely um, 
those changes are invisible. We're, we're actually changing them kind of on the fly and in sections. Uh, but what we're doing is we're really setting the stage to put new technologies in place and have a solid foundation to build these uh, incremental enhancements on uh, moving forward. So that's kind of where we're headed. Um, so let's talk about what happened in, in 2020. Uh, first of all, uh, did a great no amount of training uh, within our development organization, particularly the team that I'm a part of, um, to, to get them trained on accessibility. So using assistive technologies to be able to consume uh, digital content, and in this case, specifically the ETD administrator application. Um, we have integrated accessibility tools into our uh, development process. It's part of what we do every day now, a uh, commitment to that. And you know, the, the, the outcome from that after uh, you know, internal audits and a, a, a lot of work running uh, accessibility tools is now we are um, WCAG 2.0 compliant uh, with our application. So, you know, if that's, that's an ongoing thing, we're adding code all the time. You have to be diligent about that. But, um, you know, we've, we've, we've taken these steps and it's a focus for us to make sure that those that utilize assistive technologies can utilize um, our, our application. You know, down below, and I believe we'll publish the, the details uh, or the, the presentation later, um, there's a, just a policy statement from, from ProQuest and then the, the, a link to our VPAD as well, so you can see the results of, uh, of uh, what we did to become uh, WCAG compliant. Yeah. Next slide, Austin, please. Uh, the next one, as I, I talked about earlier, um, is our technology refresh. So again, there's a lot of things going on under the covers where we are going in and replacing old technology and components and rewriting services and simplifying the code base um, with the intent of one, Im improving our application responsiveness, um, and two, um, we're really kind of building the foundation for these other improvements we're gonna talk about um, going into late 2021 and, and, and beyond. So, um, you know, that's, it's, it's, it's been a very interesting year thus far doing that, but we've, we've, it's, and it's, hopefully it's been unapparent, as, as strange as that might sound to you, your user experience has been seamless, but these are important investments in the platform so that we can continue to deliver high service levels to you as you process your, your ETDs. Um, we pull a slide, doesn't really matter. Let's talk about that. So one of the things that we did roll out kind of at the beginning of uh, year, um, despite the focus on, um, on uh, author workflow, uh, is we rolled out a new feature called committee review. And I listened to a session earlier where it kind of made me think that we, we need to do a better job of, of promoting this. But so what we have is we have added uh, essentially a new module within the ETD administrator so that um, uh, a student who submits an ETD can specify the folks that they, they want to review their ETD. Typically, the way we've, when we've gone out and talked to customers or customers, universities, it's, it's at the very end. After um, the, the ETD has been finalized by the administrator, they're ready, you know, it's all ready to, to be pushed into the, to, to the IR. They want one last check to put it in front of um, uh, any there changes by organization, but any of the committee review members that they would want to get a final blessing for, it sends them a, an email with a, a secure link. They can review the ETD and either um, approve it as is um, because it matches what they expect to see, or it, they could also um, reject it and provide comments. Um, it also, the, the good part about this, or one of the many good parts about it is, it doesn't require credentials for anybody to do that review work. It's done um, linked up to ETD administrator, but it's, you don't need credentials to log in. So um, if you have any questions about that, and it's kind of, I guess, really in the takeaways, um, would, would love to, to, to walk you through that and, and give you some more, um, some more information on exac exactly how that works and how it might be able to fit within your workflows. Oh, that's the one I expected to see first. There we go. So that's just what it looks like from uh, from an administrator uh, administrator console perspective. Um, so there's a, a a new link that you pull up, and you can see all of uh, the the ETDs that are in a committee review status. Uh, you can you know, see the author, see the departments. As you, I mean, just reading across the top, um, and, and and just be able to see what's going on there. You can ping um, the, the review committee and ask them to, to take action if they have not, or uh, if, they're, if they're not doing, responding as needed, you actually, uh, as an administrator, have the ability to go ahead and approve that and push it through. 
um, again, uh, there, and I'm sorry, Austin, back up there real quickly. At the bottom, there is a link to a to a demo. I'm sorry, don't don't back up. I don't know what's going to happen if we do that. Uh, there is a link to a, to a demo that you can watch as well um, to give you an idea about that. And please do follow up with uh, Austin or myself or April uh, to 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 get a, a more full um, demo of that and talk a bit again about how it might fit into your workflow. Um, there you go. Thank you. Uh, one of the other things that we've we've done this year, and it's in combination with our uh, the ex libris portion of our our, our, uh, our company, is we they have put out a new institutional repository called Esploro, and we are now as an ETD administrator um, offering um, uh, integration into that. So, uh, you know. If, if, there's there's many options in the market. Uh, you know, we feel like we've got a really good combination here of you know ingestion of the ETD through the ETD administrator, and then Esploro uh, uh, providing the IR functionality within your your institution. And you know what we like to talk about here is the fact that you know they're developed by the same company. You're supported by the same uh, the same group. Anytime we make changes or they make changes, we're coordinated. So we make sure any, if we're going to deliver to that IR from ETD administrator, we know it's going to work. We're not going to have any any uh, challenges with a handshake between those two things. And um, you know, from a user experience perspective, it looks the same. When you get to uh, the, the 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 final portions of the administrator workflow, the the ETD is approved. You just again simply hit. Uh, deliver and it delivers to both um, uh, PQDT and then also to uh, your Esploro um, uh, uh, institutional repository instance. So, um, you know, that's just kind of the high level on that. Uh, it, again, if there's any questions, you can reach out to Austin and, and myself and April and we can put you in touch uh, with the Esploro team as well. Um, so, let's give you a little. Uh, preview of what's going on. This is not launch yet, um, but I do want to tell you about some, some, some important things that are happening. So as we've gone out and do, done a lot of discussions with, um, with our customer base, um, uh, it's been apparent that you know, we do a good job of ingesting uh, ETDs into uh, PQDT, uh, PQDT Open. Um, but you know what? How do how do people get insights into the the the, the reach and the impact of those ETDs that are, that are out there? So um, we've had a it's a probably a beta level um, dashboard that's been available for a number of years, and just looking at that need in the market to be able to uh, to be able to get those insights into what the impact of your ETDs is, um, we have kind of resurrected the ETD dashboard and we are. Um, doing a number of things. We're, we're fixing the back end so it's more performant. We're changing the look and feel of it. Um, we've added a new retrievals benchmarking uh, visualization at the bottom. Um, so, uh, you know, it's just, it, 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 it just meets the needs of folks. We're checking this with a, uh, a discovery community right now as we've, we put that out. And um, actually it's, it's at the point where we have a, a beta release that we're putting in people's hands. So, um, stay tuned on that, but I think that this is going to be something moving forward that you're going to be able to um, going to be able to to use to to show the value of your your dissertations and theses that are that are in our repository. Um, all right, on to my section now. So that's kind of what we were up to in 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 this year to this point. Let's go on to um, what's up for 2021 and beyond. So, uh, you know, I mentioned. Uh, uh, earlier administrator workflow enhancements. So through any number of um, entry points, could be a call to customer service, it could be a call to, um, to Austin, it could be somebody reaching out to Angela, you know, we've, and this kind of covers what's under one and two here. Um, we've had a number of requests for enhancements that we've been collecting. And as, um, you know, as a product owner, as I've been going through those requests that are kind of in emails and in JIRA and a number of other places, there's a couple of them that have shown um, a, a fair amount of demand or more than a fair amount, of, but it's, it's, you know, it's not a onesie twosie thing. So those are reflected in those six bullets. Is that six? I can count today. I guess it is. Um, underneath the, um, the, red, the red administrator workflow enhancements, um, some of these might be familiar to you. Uh, auto delivering batches of ETDs based on schedule criteria, enhancements to our reporting, 
um, being able to update embargo dates. Um, we've seen some re uh, requests for being able to change uh, administrators to an inactive status, so you can't assign something to them. Um, making shag t tags shareable, excuse me. Um, and then some just various configurable things around degree dates and embargo dates. So um, I'll talk to in a minute about how I need your input and, and, and help us figure out what it is that we should prioritize going forward. Um, with that, but let's go to two. Uh, I, I think I spoke directly about this earlier, the student self-management uh, of their account information. So being able to update their mailing address or being able to um, uh, uh, change an email uh, post submission. That's something that requires a ticket right now and frankly would be I think uh, helpful for the student and the administrator as well as our support teams. We take that load off of them um, and, and allow them to do that in a self-service method. And then finally for uh, really 2021 uh, it, it, in the beginning of it we talked earlier about the enhancements that we're doing to modernize uh, the author workflow of ETD administrator. Uh, the beginning of the year, we're going to transition our development team over to working on um, modernization of the administrator workflow. Hopefully, we'll be able to find a couple of those bullets there on the left-hand side that we can kind of work into that that workflow and deliver them as well, uh, along with um, you know somewhat of the invisible foundational changes we'll do with the platform as well. Um, and there's also some exploration around exploring uh, content accessibility that uh, we're, we're we're just having. Uh, discussions with folks as, as well. So if you have any thoughts on that, um, we'd, we'd like to hear that maybe in the, the follow up here at the end. Um, this is my ask for you. So we talked about all these enhancements that have come in through various channels. Uh, we have uh, a couple of mechanisms in place to get your feedback on uh, not only ETD administrator, but any of the other products that you see uh, listed on the, the right hand side of the, of the slide here. But we have a portal called ideas.proquest.com, or that's the URL, it's not what it's called. And you can go in there, you can click on any of the, the products there and provide feedback um, on uh, your experience, any enhancements you'd like to see, um, and just comments in general. So uh, I'm in there on a pretty regular basis, um, uh, just going through those, trying to find trends, seeing what we should prioritize to the top of the list and maybe put into our backlog. So, you know, you are the users, your institutions are the, the users of ET Administrator. You know, we rely on you to tell us, you know, what we need to do to deliver more value. And this is a, a great mechanism for you to have a voice uh, and submit ideas. And not only that, but also look at what's already been submitted and vote uh, so that we can figure out, you know, where the demand is and what we should prioritize moving forward. <clears throat> Excuse me. One new thing is if you are actually using ETD Administrator, uh, you may or may not have noticed if you've been in the, in the application that there's this little leave feedback um, kind of cue with a light bulb in the, uh, the lower right hand uh, part of the screen when you're logged in. What that is, is that is um, a, creates a, if you click on that, it creates a pop-up window and that will automatically walk you through um, submitting an idea that gets put into ideas.proquest.com. So please explore that. If you have any questions about it, please reach out to us. But again, it's your, your ideas and your votes are gonna help us shape the future of this. And just with the organization we looked at uh, earlier, I mean, we're, we're really focusing being on uh, being uh, driven by demand, uh, you know, demand and input from uh, or data, I guess is the other word I'm looking for, to figure out what we're going to do forward. So we're we're relying on you to help us with that. Uh, go ahead, Austin. Yeah. So um, I think I did reasonably on time here, um, but uh, I guess really now it's it's opening up to the floor, um, and I think April's joined us as well. She might have some things to 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 add to to what I went through. But um, we're just looking for a little time. I think there were some comments and, and Austin, maybe you can go through the, through, um, I can't see some of the questions that have come in right now from the view I have, but maybe somebody can read those off and we can, we can address them or we can also take questions live. I've been addressing some of the questions as well. So some of the answers are in chat. Hello everyone. Um, but go ahead, I'm sorry. Yeah, the There's question. one question that says, discuss the process for using ProQuest as a way to get students permission to put dissertations to the university digital repository. Is there some kind of document that's, that the students can sign or how is that handled? 
Yes, there is part of the student workflow. The administrator can upload a document that the student has to review and sign and approve before they can submit. So um, all you would have to do is work with our customer service team with your document. We would put that into your site for you and then make that part of the student workflow. Um, great. There's another question. Uh, actually a comment, suggestion, please add confirmation emails to students submitting revisions. It causes so much confusion and they got one the first time, but then none any other time. I think that sounds pretty important to me. It is, and you're talking to the right person. So it's now uh, something we'll, actually, I'd like to, whoever submitted that, reach out to me. We will walk through ideas.proquest.com and we'll put it in or search for it. So either either do that with, through self-discovery or I can help you get it in there and, and we'll figure out how that fits into our prioritization. Like to hear, like to hear suggestions, it's great. Uh, someone said, how can we be part of the beta and discovery community for the dashboard? Good question. So we're, we're trying to, we have a, a, a short list kind of involved in our first pass. Um, that's that's actually getting ready to kick off. Um, I, we don't really have a firm plan for when we might widen that up a little bit more, but if you have interest, um, please do reach out to, to April and myself. And as we figure out how we can, uh, uh, you know, scale up a little bit beyond kind of a, a, the beta level that we're at right now, um, we would certainly like to, to get you in, involved as, as, as soon as reasonably possible and definitely have you um, available, or not available, but, but logged on and using when we, when we go live. Um, there's a follow-up question to the documents about getting students permission. Uh, this person said, do you provide examples of these documents that we can use? So if there are documents that other universities use, how do you share that, or can you share that with another school who needs that kind of help? That's a very interesting question. Um, I may have to ask Austin for some help here with his experience. Austin, have we had that request where we can share other university documents? I think that I'm not sure if we're able to do that from a legal perspective. Yes, we did have some permissions from universities who offered to share the documents, uh, particularly that permission document that was asked earlier. So I'll make a note and uh, follow up with that. Sure, and, and I would even say that um, you know, again, pitching for our, our, our community, our ideas at proquest.com, you know, the, the, the secondary function that we're trying to get out of that is to, to create a, a group of people that can get together and, and ask questions like that and see if somebody would be willing to share an example. So again, that's not the primary reason we, we have that portal in place, but um, you know, that's, that's something that, that could possibly take place there as well as you, you'd post a question about whether somebody would be willing to, to share that, that type of a document. Yes, and I'll just add that, that you know, the uh, obtaining permission for, from authors to use the ETD in your repository has not been implemented uh, far and wide. There's many, many universities that have not implemented that, that still have an offline paper form uh, or another paper form for the author to, to sign. So we would very much like to work with any of you that are on the, 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 um, the webinar today who have not implemented that because that, that is one of the key ways to save time and effort from students uh, having to go through a separate process. And really that's one of the key advantages of ETD Administrator to have this single path of permissioning uh, and uploading the PDF, et cetera, that feeds both the repository and ProQuest. So we do strongly encourage you uh, to explore that with us. It might not work on in every circumstance, but we very much would like to have a d dialogue with you to ensure that you know how that might work and for you to give it careful consideration. I would suspect you could add a, if someone is managing their own instance, they could add a question that's required. And when the student says yes or no, that's considered a digital signature. Yes, there's a checkbox at the bottom of the university author agreement that uh, indicates that the authors read it and approved it. And then that permission goes with the metadata that we send back to the university. So should uh, an author come back a few years later and say, hey, how did you get my uh, PDF in, in your IR? I don't remember giving you permission. You can go back into the metadata and let them know 
the time and date that that was completed and that their submission was completed so that that will help them remember that they actually did provide the university with permission. I would think that it's that's backwards that anybody who's graduating a student that it's automatically required to go to the IR because that's proof that they did their work to graduate. That's right. Here's another question. How do you plan to protect your dashboard against the bots? So that's part of what we're doing from a security perspective and looking at, at, at that information. So it's going to be, you know, secure. It's going to be, you're going to have credentials just for you and your organization. It's going to be read only. It's, it's not something where you go in and you're making any changes to any metadata or, or any of the information. So um, I don't have, you know, what we're going to do from a security perspective in front of me, but that is certainly a part of, of what we're doing is ensuring that what we're doing is secure no data can be compromised for anybody who might be able to happen to get in. Um, so I, I can follow up with more, but, but, but we are certainly aware that that's something that we need to, to have as a part of our, um, our launch criteria is having the security checked out thoroughly. And David, maybe if you wouldn't mind or April uh, talk a little bit about the credentialing and access for dashboard, because uh, I believe it's going to be different than the beta version for those that are familiar with the beta version. Um, so we are going to utilize uh, single sign-on to, to be able to um, to be able to access that. So our own ProQuest single sign-on, and um, utilize uh, uh, email addresses rather than some uh, random handle assigned to be able to log in. So between those two things, that's going to give us another layer layer of uh, protection to to be able to get in and and and, and get that to get access to a dashboard. So just it's behind the same single sign on you'll be utilizing for any of the other ProQuest products. I do think there's one question that someone hasn't been answered and they asked, can the committee review be limited just the committee chair or co-chairs? So can you limit the number of fields that the student puts in for committee members? It, it's, you can, you can specify who goes in by, you know, as a matter of policy and just have those, have those names included in the review list. So you know, there's some degree of you, you choose what to put in there. I, I, we don't have any mechanism to say, you know, only, only this type of a position uh, would, be, would be allowed to, to put in. So that'd be something that would be up to the student and, and the university administrator of to, to enforce. In, in the setup. Right. Um, well, in setup, you would just you turn on the fact that you have or you're going to utilize um, committee committee review. Um, but then, you know, there's there's no there's no mechanism. There's no logic to limit who you can put in those. You can actually put in external um, uh, reviewers if, if you would want to. So that's an interesting uh, thought is but it's not part of, uh, you know, we, we don't limit that right now. It's something that's yeah. that's that, we do allow you to designate who's the chair and then who are the other members. So you can differentiate that. We can, but, but we, don't limit, we don't limit just to them. Mm -hmm. Right. Okay. There's a chair designation, correct. But the ET, but the administrator could go into the file and update the committee members that are in there for and the students. Correct. And then that would then become the list that would be part, that would be circulated for the committee review if the administrator has the ability to do that, to edit what the student has put in. Great, Janice, are there any uh, other questions? Um, I think I've been trying to ask everyone that's in here that didn't get addressed. Um, my question is, do the committee members get notified that they need to review? Absolutely, it? absolutely. So when uh, when the administrator, uh, you know, sends it out for committee review, those those um, reviewers receive an email, and inside of that email, it has a secure link inside of it that allows them to go and see what it is that they need to review. Gives them um, access to the the PDF of the the ETD, access to any of the supplemental files. 
um, they can re review them then and then also, um, you know, register essentially their decision if they approve it or if they don't and be able to provide comments back. And again, that the, the way we have this set up with, uh, with this secure link is um, doesn't require them to have ETD administrator credentials to do that. So you can have anybody do it even outside of your your organization. That's correct. And you can monitor in the dashboard, it gives you the ability correct. to look at the status of which committee members have done their approval, which haven't. You can remind the committee members through the dashboard to spur them along, as you know, they, they are not always responsive. Um, and you can always, if you wish, you can have it set up so that the administrator can override. If a committee member just doesn't ever you can't reach them and they're not they're not responsive and they're holding up the submission you as an institution can make the decision to allow the administrator to override the committee review so that you can move things along um if you have you know if there's a a challenge with getting a hold of an of a particular advisor but that's up to the institution we can do that for you Great, thank you. Well, April, I think that there there might be time if you're if uh, you think it's appropriate to talk about that merging trends and challenges. If you want, I think we had talked about you potentially. Uh, yeah, you can go to you can go to the next slide. I mean, it's really a continuation of the, okay. the discussion here. Really, is you know uh, we're we're looking for for input from you about you know within within your day to day life, what what are things that are happening that 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 we need to be aware of so that we can have our finger on the pulse of what's happening, understand what your new challenges are, and then um, you know, it, work collaboratively really with, with the entire community here to figure out what it is that we can do to, to address these challenges and okay. make your lives better. So well, I mean, there are some emerging challenges that have come through, you know, clearly with the new normal, there are some new challenges that we've been hearing. Um, we've, I've been doing some webinars to, um, you know, help, you know, help graduate students and to help provide resources to advisors and to graduate schools and to libraries as well to help support graduate students as they're working remotely. You know, the, the remote work for them offers another layer of stress and concern and complexity to an already complicated and difficult time for them. So I think what we'd really, I mean, one thing we would be interested in hearing is how has, you know, the COVID-19 and the working away from from home and other, um, you know, challenges to students. How has that impacted your workflow with them? And are there new and emerging trends that are coming out of this that you see as ways that we could take ETD admin to continue to support the student and help you support the student? So I'd be really curious if there's anything emerging that you're hearing about um, that we could, you know, think of something as a long-term solution to help help graduate students. So I'll open the floor to any any ideas, but that was just one that I had, um, you know, having been talking a lot about this with um, with librarians and other stakeholders. Um, I have one question along that line. We haven't really touched on it in this particular conference, but I've been to other conferences in, in other years, and there was quite a bit of conversation about um, ETDs that were in a different format that were not PDFs and, and how are you prepared to handle that if a university starts or students you know that's more what students start to do how are yeah you yeah that's a really good question so yes we do have um, these non-traditional I think you're kind of I think you're referring to non-traditional dissertations and theses from especially the arts and the humanities um, where they have, say, maybe music score or something that is unique and not really a written document. Right now, we have, um, you are able to submit supplemental files with your, with your document. And those supplemental files really are, can be any kind of file that the student would like to, to share, whether it's, you know, a picture, a movie, and there's really no limit on how large that file can be. And we clearly have, you know, some interest in evolving our way that we work with um, with these non-traditional you know, theses and, and dissertations too. So any feedback that you have on how to best do that, because they are unique, right? And there's a wide variety of formats and, and ways that students want to deliver. And there is, you know, varied as the students are creative. So um, it, we do have a way to accept those um, in, in ETD admin right now. So, but we would be interested in learning how to do that better, 
because I do think that we can accommodate that type of um, thought, that type of thesis or dissertation better. Great. Um, there was a comment here that said they would love a demo of the different functions. They feel like their university is not using um, all the features that they possibly could and they'd like demos. So I suggest you uh, create a little email blast to every uh, buddy who is at the conference and invite them, you know. Um, other questions. How, how many students utilize the open access option? That's just a question that came in. I don't Sorry. know if I know that. <laughs> I think it's about 5% a yeah. year, isn't it, April? I was yeah. going to say 6%, 5 to 6%. Okay. <laughs> so it's not, yeah, you're right. I mean, Austin knows this stuff really well. So, yeah, so it's a relatively small um, proportion of students that opt in. I think that for them, the challenge um, is always, even though our, you know, we do, would the students pay a fee, um, a document fee to process and make the content open access? We're in the process of really evaluating our open access model and how that works at the moment. Um, it's, a, it's, a, it's not a very large fee, but for any fee for a student at that time of, of submission can be a, a challenge. And so we're recognizing that, you know, there are various models in which we can promote more open access publishing um, while still being able to, you know, keep, keep the lights on. So we're working on different ways to, um, to help students to publish open access more often. But yes, we don't have very, as, as many um, as, as, as we would like. So we're working on that. I would imagine it's not a great source of income for you. So maybe revisit why we're doing that. Well, no, yes, that's right. And so really, you know, trying to have the largest schools that have thousands of dissertations a year and the small schools that literally have five per year um, and don't have an institutional repository is really why that was developed. It was really developed for those institutions. You know, 10 years ago, repositories weren't as common as they are now. And so uh, universities said to us, we don't have an IR. I don't know when we can spin one up. So please give the students an option of, of submitting open access. And we have many, many institutions, uh, mostly this on the smaller side, who do a lot of open access publishing with ProQuest. Then conversely, we have very large institutions who, uh, who have a, a wonderful repository. They have lots of usage in their repository and they don't want the students to uh, not know that they're making their work available through their repository and not make it available through ProQuest. That's fine too. We're happy to help you with language and, and messaging that in your ETD site. Um, so I, I think that's a little bit of ProQuest ETD administrator trying to, to please all audiences, uh, large and small audiences, and um, making it available for those universities who still don't have a repository. And there are unfortunately quite a few today still that don't have a repository. There's another fee type question. Um, it was about why was the fee for filing a copyright raised more than that of the amount for the U.S. Copyright Office? I mean, they said it's, we understand it's a service, but it was not raised by the same amount. Yes, so I can uh, address that one. So here, the, the, the fee for the copyright for the Copyright Office was raised $10. We raised the fee $20 because what we found was happening is sometimes we have to submit the copyright registration twice. And uh, that's a very time consuming process because uh, the Copyright Office has become much stricter in only having single authored works submit through the ProQuest ETD administrator. Um, that's the, the, what they have available online as well at the Copyright Office is single author submission. So for example, if the author has co-written uh, a chapter or maybe a chapter is a journal article that has multiple authors, that work will, will be rejected from the Copyright Office. And then ProQuest has to resubmit it in a different methodology. Uh, essentially, we're paying twice for that submission. Uh, we, we changed ETD Administrator to message much more clearly that only single authored works should be put forward. 
but we and we also thought about well how might we catch these uh, if they are multiple authored works that will be rejected by the copyright office how can we catch them before they go to the copyright office and unfortunately we didn't we weren't aren't able to find a way at this point though we're still looking into it but uh, because of this resubmission of quite a few works we've raised the fee to cover that additional registration uh, double submission. So one thing that you can do um, uh, is help us to, to uh, ensure that authors, to the extent they come to your office, or the extent they communicate with you about copyright registration, if you wouldn't mind, please do reinforce to them that single authored submissions are what should be put through ETD Administrator. And any multi-authored works, those are uh, a separate path that the author should work directly with the Copyright Office and the Copyright Office website to do. Uh, ETD Administrator contains a link to the Copyright Office for those multi-authored works, uh, but we would really appreciate your help to get the word out about this as well. Great, thank you. It, I, um, I, see, I see a couple interesting ones. I'm sorry to, 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 to interrupt, Janice. One is I see that there's a, a, a note here from Jill Boren. I'm sorry if I butchered your, your last name. Uh, you say you're a secondary admin and your primary admin's out. Log in to ETD Administrator. There's multiple places where you're able to go and contact ProQuest support. Um, just reach out through that link and we'll get you taken care of so that you can, you can take care of business while your primary admin's out. Um, and sorry, I did see one other thing and I know April wants to hear about this one. Uh, there's a question about a presenter today indicated that, that the PDF is going away. What is your take on that statement? <laughs> Sorry to throw you that softball, everybody, or say, throw that to April, but we've been talking about this internally, <laughs> and I wanted to. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the PDF is going away. Wow, I missed That's a that. bold statement. It is, yes. Um, I'd like to under, I wish I had known more about the context of that. Um, like for the IR, or is that sort of where the PDF? Trina, is? Trina, are you on to, to clarify a little bit? Yes, I'm here. I, I wish I could remember um, which presentation it was in. I can, I can uh, think about that a little bit and email you directly. Um, but okay, yeah. great. Yeah. Well, I can definitely say that the PDFs are a mixed bag, right? They, provide, you know, they were meant to be lightweight ways to, some, you know, share documents so you can read them. They really weren't constructed and, you know, de you know, devised as a means to contain a lot of rich information about the document. It's not, you know, they're not good for accessibility um, because a lot of the information that is required for our screen readers is stripped away from the PDF. So there's a lot of challenges with having a PDF. So unfortunately, a lot of our legacy is PDF. That's ProQuest, that's everybody. I mean, we just really drank the PDF Kool-Aid, right? And everybody's got PDFs everywhere. So for us going forward, for um, we really are considering, well, how do we change up our model of, of the PDF? And I'm glad you asked, because what I would really like to learn from administrators and from the grad schools is if we were to offer, right, right now in, e, in ETD admin, you can go and you uh, can- We're upload. like 30 seconds, so. Oh, sorry. The student can upload a PDF or they can upload a Word document that converts into a PDF. And so I'd be curious to know if we were to have the Word document as the way to upload um, into ETD admin, could we sort of move from the PDF into a much more dynamic and rich type of formatting? So yes, perhaps it will die, by it'll be a while. <laughs> we, we need to end this session. I appreciate all the questions. They're great questions. I appreciate all of you from uh, ProQuest being on the front line and helping everything be digital in our worlds now. And um, stay here because we're all going into our virtual cocktail hour, apparently. So we'll turn the time over to uh, John. Well, thank, thank you, everyone. Thank, thank you, you so much, everyone. Thank you folks from ProQuest, it was an outstanding session. <clears throat> Always a lot of interest here.